chapter one of the canadians of old this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary the canadians of old by philippe aubert de gaspe translated by sir charles g d roberts leaving college Eu fugaces postume horace as my story lays no claim to classicism either in style or structure this opening chapter may as well be made to play the part of a preface my acquaintances will doubtless open their eyes on seeing me thus enter at the age of seventy-six on the perilous paths of authorship possibly i owe them an explanation although tired of reading all these years with so little profit either to myself or others i yet dreaded to pass the rubicon a matter small enough in itself in the end decided me one of my friends a man of parts whom i met last year in st louis street in our good city of quebec grasped me warmly by the hand and exclaimed awfully glad to see you do you know my dear fellow i have talked this morning with no fewer than eleven people not one of them with half an idea in his noddle and he wrung my arm almost out of joint really said i you are very complimentary for i perceive by the warmth of your greeting that i am the exception the man you oh yes indeed he cried without letting me finish my sentence those are the only sensible words i have heard this morning and he crossed the street to speak to some one probably his addlepate number twelve who was seeking to attract his attention the devil thought i to myself if what i just said is in any way brilliant it would seem easy enough to shine though i have never yet been suspected of it i must be rather a clever fellow much elated with this discovery and congratulating myself that i had more brains than the unhappy eleven of whom my friend had spoken i hurry to my library i furnish myself perhaps all too appropriately with a ream of the paper called fool's cap and i set myself to work i write for my own amusement at the risk of wearying the reader who may have the patience to go through this volume but as nature has made me compassionate i will give this dear reader a little good advice he had better throw away the unlucky book without taking the trouble to criticize it which would be making it much too important and would be moreover but wasted labor for the serious critic for unlike that old archbishop of granada so touchy on the subject of his sermons of whom gil blas has told us i am for my part blessed with an easy humor and instead of retorting to my critic i wish you good luck and very much better taste i will frankly admit that my book has a thousand faults of most of which i have a lively consciousness as for the unfriendly critic his work will be all in vain debarred as he will be from the privilege of dragging me into a controversy let me say beforehand that i grieve to deprive him of his gentle diversion and to clip his claws so soon i am old and indolently content like figaro of merry memory moreover i have not enough self-conceit to engage in any defence of my literary productions to record some incidents of a well-loved past to chronicle some memories of a youth long flown this is my whole ambition many of the anecdotes doubtless will appear insignificant and childish to some readers let these lay the blame upon certain of our best men of letters who besought me to leave out nothing which could illustrate the manners and customs of the early canadians that which will appear insignificant and childish to the eyes of strangers they urged in the records of a septuagenarian born but twenty-eight years after the conquest of new france will yet not fail to interest true canadians this production of mine shall be neither very dull nor surpassingly brilliant an author should assuredly have too much self-respect to make his appeal exclusively to the commonplace and if i should make the work too fine it would be appreciated by none but the beaux esprits 
under a constitutional government a candidate must concern himself rather with the number than the quality of his votes this work will be canadian through and through it is hard for an old fellow of seventy to change his ancient coat for garb of modern pattern i must have also plenty of elbow room as for rule and precept which by the way i am well enough acquainted with i cannot submit myself to them in a work like this let the purists the past masters in the art of literature shocked at my mistakes dub my book romance memoir annals miscellany hotchpotch it is all the same to me having accomplished my preface let me make a serious beginning with the following pretty bit of verse hitherto unpublished and doubtless now much surprised to find itself in such unworthy company quebec seventeen fifty seven an eagle city on her heights austere taker of tribute from the chainless flood she watches wave above her in the clear the whiteness of her banner purged with blood near her grim citadel the blinding sheen of her cathedral spire triumphant soars rocked by the angelus whose peal serene beats over beaupre and the levy shores tossed in his light craft on the dancing wave a stranger where he once victorious trod the passing iroquois fierce-eyed and grave frowns on the flag of france the cross of god let him who knows this quebec of ours betake himself in body or in spirit to the market of the upper town and consider the changes which the region has undergone since the year of grace seventeen fifty seven whereat my story opens there was then the same cathedral minus its modern tower which seems to implore the charitable either to raise it to its proper height or to decapitate its lofty and scornful sister the jesuits college at a later date transformed into a barrack looked much the same as it does to-day but what has become of the church which stood of old in the place of the present halls where is the grove of venerable trees behind the building which adorned the grounds now so bare of this edifice sacred to the education of canadian youth time and the axe alas have worked their will in place of the merry sports the mirthful sallies of the students the sober steps of the professors the high philosophic discourse we hear now the clatter of arms the coarse jest of the guard instead of the market of the present day some low-built butcher's stalls perhaps seven or eight in number occupied a little plot between the cathedral and the college between these stalls and the college prattled a brook which after descending st louis street and dividing fabrique traversed cuillard and the hospital garden on its way to the river st charles our fathers were bucolic in their tastes it is the end of april the brook is overflowing children are amusing themselves by detaching from its edges cakes of ice which shrinking as they go overleap all barriers and lose themselves at last in the mighty tide of the st lawrence a poet who finds sermons in stones books in the running brooks dreaming over the scene and marking the descent of the ice cakes their pausings their rebuffs might have compared them to those ambitious men who after a restless life come with little wealth or fame to the end of their career and are swallowed up in eternity the houses neighboring the market-place are for the most part of but one story unlike our modern structures which tower aloft as if dreading another deluge it is noon the angelus rings out from the cathedral belfry all the city chimes proclaim the greeting of the angel to the virgin who is the canadian's patron saint the loitering habitants whose calashes surround the stalls take off their caps and devoutly murmur the angelus all worshipping alike there is none to deride the pious custom 
some of our nineteenth century christians seem ashamed to perform before others an act of worship which is proof to say the least of a shrinking or cowardly spirit the followers of mohammed who have the courage of their convictions wherever they may chance to be will seven times daily make their prayers to allah under the eyes of the more timid christians the students of the jesuits college noisy enough on ordinary occasions move to-day in a serious silence from the church wherein they have been praying what causes this unusual seriousness they are on the eve of separation from two beloved fellow students the younger of the two who being more of their age was wont to share more often in their boyish sports was the protector of the feeble against the strong the impartial arbitrator in all their petty disagreements the great door of the college opens and two young men in travelling dress join the group of their fellow students two leathern portmanteaus five feet long adorned with rings chains and padlocks which would seem strong enough for the mooring of a ship lie at their feet the younger of the two slight and delicate looking is perhaps eighteen years old his dark complexion great black eyes alert and keen his abruptness of gesture proclaim his french blood his name is jules d'aberville his father is one of the seigneurs captain of a company in the colonial marine his companion who is older by two or three years is much taller and more robust of frame his fine blue eyes his chestnut hair his blond and ruddy complexion with a few scattered freckles on face and hands his slightly aggressive chin all these reveal a foreign origin this is archibald cameron of lochiel commonly known as archie of lochiel a young scotch highlander who has been studying at the jesuits college in quebec how is it that he a stranger finds himself in this remote french colony we will let the sequel show the young men are both notably good-looking they are clad alike with hooded overcoat scarlet leggings edged with green ribbon blue woolen knitted garters a broad belt of vivid colors embroidered with glass beads deer-hide moccasins tied in iroquois fashion the insteps embroidered with porcupine quills and finally caps of beaver skin fastened over the ears by means of a red silk handkerchief knotted under the chin the younger betrays a feverish eagerness and keeps glancing along buade street you are in a hurry to leave us jules said one of his friends reproachfully no replied d'aberville oh no indeed my dear de la ronde i assure you but since this parting must take place i wish it over it unnerves me and it is natural that i should be in a hurry to get back home again that is right said de la ronde and moreover since you are a canadian we hope to see you again before very long but with you the case is different my dear archie said another i fear this parting will be for ever if you return to your own country promise us that you will come back cried all the students during this conversation jules darts off like an arrow to meet two men each with an oar on his right shoulder who are hastening along by the cathedral one of them wears the costume of the habitant capote of black homespun gray woolen cap gray leggings and garters belt of many colors and heavy cowhide larrigans tied in the manner of the iroquois the dress of the other is more like that of our young travelers although much less costly the first tall and rough-mannered is a ferryman of point levy the second shorter but of athletic build is a follower of captain d'aberville jules father in times of war a soldier in peace he occupies the place of a favored servant he is the captain's foster brother and of the same age he is the right hand of the family he has rocked jules in his arms singing him the gay catches of our up-river boatmen dear jose how are you how have you left them all at home 
cried jules flinging his arms about him oh well enough thank god replied jose they send you all kinds of love and are in a great way to see you but how you have grown in the last few months lord master jules but it is good to set eyes on you again in spite of the familiar affection lavished upon jose by the whole d'aberville family he never forgot to be scrupulously respectful jules overwhelms him with eager inquiries he asks about the servants about the neighbors and about the old dog whom when in his thirty-sixth lesson he had christened niger to display his proficiency in latin he has forgiven even the greedy cat who the year before had gobbled up a young pet nightingale which he had intended to take to college with him in the first heat of his wrath it is true he had hunted the assassin with a club under tables chairs and beds and finally on to the roof itself which the guilty animal had sought as an impregnable refuge now however he has forgiven the creature's misdeeds and makes tender inquiry after its health hello there grumbles the ferryman who takes very little interest in the above scenes when you have done slobbering and chattering about the cat and dog perhaps you'll make a move the tide won't wait for nobody in spite of the impatience and ill-humor of the ferryman it took long to say farewell their instructors embraced them affectionately you are to be soldiers both of you said the principal in daily peril of your life upon the battlefield you must keep god ever before you it may be the will of heaven that you fall be ready therefore at all times that you may go before the judgment seat with a clear conscience take this for your battle cry god the king and fatherland farewell exclaimed archie you who have opened your hearts to the stranger farewell kind friends who have striven to make the poor exile forget that he belonged to an alien race farewell perhaps for ever this parting would be hard indeed for me said jules deeply moved had i not the hope that my regiment will soon be ordered to canada then turning to his instructors he said i have tried your patience sorely gentlemen but you know that my heart has always been better than my head i beg that you will forgive the one for the sake of the other as for you my fellow students he continued with a lightness that was somewhat forced you must admit that if i have tormented you sadly with my nonsense during the last ten years i have at least succeeded in sometimes making you laugh seizing archie by the arm he hurried him off in order to conceal his emotion we may leave our travellers now to cross the st lawrence and rejoin them a little later at point levy end of chapter one chapter two of the canadians of old by philippe aubert de gaspe translated by sir charles g d roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary d'abreville and cameron of lochiel give me oh give me back the days when i i too was young and felt as they now feel each coming hour new consciousness of power the fields the grove the air was haunted and all that age has disenchanted give me oh give youth's passions unconfined the rush of joy that felt almost like pain Guta. archibald cameron of lochiel son of a highland chief who had wedded a daughter of france was but four years old when he lost his mother brought up by his father who was in the language of the scriptures a valiant hunter in the sight of god ever since ten years old he had followed him in the chase of the roebuck and other wild beasts scaling the highest mountains swimming the icy torrents making his couch on the wet sod with no covering but his plaid no roof but the vault of heaven 
under such a spartan training the boy came to find his chief delight in this wild and wandering life when archie was but twelve years old in the year seventeen forty five his father joined the standard of that unhappy young prince who after the old romantic fashion threw himself into the arms of his scottish countrymen and called upon them to win him back a crown which the bloody field of culloden forced him to renounce for ever in the early days of this disastrous struggle courage was triumphant over numbers and discipline and their mountains re-echoed to their outmost isles the songs of victory the enthusiasm was at its height the victory seemed already won but short-lived was their triumph after achievements of most magnificent heroism they were forced to bow their necks to defeat lochiel shared the fate of the many brave whose blood reddened the heather on culloden an uncle of archie's who had also followed the standard and fortunes of the unhappy prince had the good fortune after the disaster of culloden to save his head from the scaffold through a thousand perils over a thousand obstacles he made good his flight to france with his orphan nephew the old gentleman ruined in fortune and under sentence of banishment was having a hard struggle to support himself and his charge when a jesuit an uncle of the boy on his mother's side undertook a share of the burden archie was sent to the jesuits college in quebec having completed a thorough course in mathematics he is leaving college when the reader makes his acquaintance archibald cameron of lochiel whom the harsh hand of misfortune had brought to an early maturity knew not at first what to make of a boy noisy troublesome and mocking who seemed the despair alike of masters and students to be sure the boy had not all the fun on his own side out of twenty canings and impositions bestowed upon his class jules d'aberville was sure to pocket at least nineteen for his share it must be acknowledged also that the older pupils driven to the end of their patience bestowed upon him sometimes more knocks than nuts but you would have thought the youngster regarded all this as an encouragement so ready was he to resume his tricks we may add that jules without being vindictive never wholly overlooked an injury in one way or another he always made matters even his satire his home thrusts which could bring a flush to the face of even the most self-possessed served his purpose very effectually with the masters or with those larger students whom he could not otherwise reach he had adopted it as his guiding principle that he would never acknowledge himself beaten and it was necessary therefore for his opponents when weary of war to make him proposals of peace the reader will doubtless conclude that the boy was cordially disliked on the contrary every one was fond of him he was the pet of the college the truth is jules had such a heart as pulses all too rarely in the breast of man to say that he was generous to a fault that he was ever ready to defend the absent to sacrifice himself in order to conceal the faults of others would not give an adequate description of his character the following incident will reveal him more effectively when he was about twelve years old a senior student got out of patience and kicked him with no intention however of hurting him much it was contrary to jules code of honor to carry complaints to the masters he contented himself with replying to his assailant you are too thick-headed you big brute for me to waste any sarcasm on you you would not understand it one must pierce your hide in some other way but be patient you will lose nothing by waiting after rejecting certain more or less ingenious schemes of vengeance jules resolved to catch his enemy asleep and shave his eyebrows a punishment which would be easy to inflict as dubuc the youth who had kicked him was a mighty heavy sleeper this plan had the further advantage of touching him on a most sensitive point for he was a handsome fellow and a good deal of a dandy 
jules had just decided on this revenge when he heard de Bouc say to one of his friends who had rallied him on looking gloomy indeed i have good reason to be for i expect my father to-morrow i have got into debt with the shopkeepers hoping that my mother would come to quebec ahead of him and would relieve me without his knowing anything about it father is close-fisted and violent he will probably strike me in the first heat of his anger and i don't know where to hide my head i have a mind to run away until the storm is over oh said jules why don't you let me help you out of the scrape the devil you say exclaimed dubuc shaking his head why said jules do you think that on account of a kick more or less i would leave a fellow-student in a scrape and exposed to the violence of his amiable papa to be sure you almost broke my back but that is another affair which we will settle later how much cash do you want my dear fellow answered dubuc that would be abusing your kindness i need a large sum and i know you were not in funds just now for you emptied your purse to help that poor woman whose husband was killed the other day a pretty story said jules as if one could not always find money to save a friend from the wrath of a father who is going to break his neck how much do you want fifty francs you shall have them this evening said the boy jules an only son belonging to a rich family indulged by everybody had his pockets always full of money father and mother uncles and aunts godfathers and godmothers they all kept loudly proclaiming that boys should not have too much money to spend at the same time they outdid each other in surreptitiously supplying his purse dubuc however had spoken truly the boy's purse was empty for the moment fifty francs was moreover quite a sum in those days the king of france was paying his red allies only fifty francs for an english scalp his britannic majesty richer or more generous was paying a hundred for the scalp of a frenchman jules did not care to apply to his uncles and his aunts the only relations he had in the city his first thought was to borrow fifty francs by pawning his gold watch which was worth at least twenty-five louis revolving the matter however he bethought himself of a certain old woman a servant of the house whom his father had dowered at her marriage and to whom he had afterward advanced enough money to set her up in business the business had prospered in her hands she was a widow rich and childless there were difficulties to surmount however the old dame was rather avaricious and crusty and on the occasion of jules last visit they had not parted on the best terms possible she had even chased him into the street with a broomstick the boy had done nothing more however than play her a little trick he had given her pet spaniel a dose of snuff and when the old lady ran to the help of her dog who was conducting himself like a lunatic he had emptied the rest of the snuff-box into a dandelion salad which she was carefully picking over for her supper hold on mother he cried as he ran away there is a good seasoning for you jules saw that it was very necessary to make his peace with the good dame and hence these preliminaries he threw his arms about her neck on entering in spite of the old woman's attempt to shield herself from these too ardent demonstrations after the way he had affronted her see my dear madeleine he cried i am come to pardon thine offences as thou must pardon all who have offended against thee everybody says thou art stingy and revengeful but that is no business of mine thou wilt get quit of it by roasting a little while in another world i wash my hands of it entirely madeleine hardly knew whether to laugh or be angry at this fantastic preamble but as she was fond of the boy for all his tricks she took the wiser course and smiled good-naturedly now that we are in a better humour continued jules let us proceed to business i have been a little foolish and have got into debt and i dread to trouble my good father about it in fact i want fifty francs to settle the unfortunate business 
can you lend me that much indeed now master d'haberville answered the old dame if that were all i had in the world i would give it all to save your father any trouble i owe so much to your father tut said jules if you talk of those halfpennies there's an end of business but listen my good madeleine since i might break my neck when i least expect it or still more probably when climbing on the roof or among the city bells i must give you a bit of writing for security i hope however to pay you back in a month at latest at this madeleine was seriously offended she refused the note and counted him out the money jules almost choked her with his embrace sprang through the window into the street and hurried back to the college at recess time that evening de Buc was freed from all anxiety on the score of his amiable papa but remember said d'haberville i still owe you for that kick hold on dear boy exclaimed de Buc with feeling i wish you would settle that right now break my head or my back with the poker only let us settle it to think that after all you have done for me you are still bearing me a grudge would be nothing less than torture a fine idea that exclaimed the boy to think that i bear any one a grudge because i am in his debt in regard to a little exchange of compliments so that is how you take it eh shake then and let us think no more about it you may brag of being the only one to scratch me without my having drawn his blood in return with these words he sprang upon the young man's shoulders like a monkey pulled out a few hairs to satisfy his conscience and scampered off to join the merry group which was waiting for him archibald of lochiel matured by bitter experiences and on that account more self-contained and more reserved than other boys of his age on his first coming to college hardly knew whether to smile or be angry at the frolics of the little imp who seemed to have taken him for his special butt and who hardly left him any peace he could not be expected to divine that this was jules's manner of showing his affection for those he loved the most one day driven to the end of his forbearance archie said to him do you know you would try the patience of a saint verily i don't know what to do with you but you have a way out of your difficulties answered jules my skin itches give me a good hiding and i'll leave you in peace that will be easy enough for you you young hercules lochiel indeed accustomed from his infancy to the trying sports of the young highlanders was at fourteen marvellously strong for his years do you think exclaimed archie that i am such a coward as to strike a boy younger and weaker than myself oh no said jules i see we agree on that score never a knock for a little fellow what suits me is a good tussle with a fellow of my own age or even a little older then shake hands and think no more about it by the way continued jules you know that comical dog de chavigny he is older than i am but so weak and miserable that i have never had the heart to punch him although he has played me such a trick as even saint francis himself would hardly pardon just think of him running to me all out of breath and exclaiming i have just snatched an egg from that greedy le tourneau who had stolen it out of the refectory here hide it he's after me where do you want me to hide it said i oh in your hat he answered he'll never think of looking for it there as for me i was fool enough to do it i ought to have mistrusted him in a moment le tourneau came up and jammed my cap down over my eyes the accursed egg nearly blinded me and i swear did not smell like a rose garden it was an addled egg found by chevigny in a nest which the hen had probably abandoned a month before i got out of that mess with the loss of a cap a vest and other garments well after the first of my fury was over i could not help laughing and if i bear him any grudge at all it is for having got ahead of me with so neat a trick i should love to get it off on de rome who keeps his hair so charmingly powdered 
as for le tourneau since he was too stupid to have invented the trick himself i contented myself with saying to him blessed are they of little wit and he professed himself proud of the compliment being glad enough after all to get off so cheaply and now my dear archie continued jules let us come to terms i am a kindly potentate and my conditions shall be most easy to please you i undertake on the word of a gentleman to diminish by one-third those tricks of mine which you lack the good taste to appreciate come now you ought to be satisfied with that if you are not utterly unreasonable for you see my dear boy i love you i would not have made peace with any one else on such advantageous terms lochiel could not help laughing as he shook the irrepressible lad it was from this conversation that the friendship between the two boys took its beginning on archie's part with a truly scottish restraint on the side of jules with the passionate warmth of which the french heart is capable a few weeks later about a month before the vacation which began then on the fifteenth of august jules seized his friend's arm and whispered come into my room i have just had a letter from father which concerns you concerns me exclaimed the other in astonishment why are you surprised retorted d'haberville do you think you are not of sufficient importance for any one to concern himself about you why all new france is talking about the handsome scotchman the mamas fearing your influence on the inflammable hearts of their daughters talk seriously of petitioning our principal never to let you appear in public except with a veil on like the women of the east come stop your fooling and let me go on with my reading but i am very much in earnest said jules and dragging his friend along with him he read him part of a letter from his father which ran as follows what you tell me about your young friend master de lochiel interests me very much i grant your request with the greatest pleasure give him my compliments and beg him to come and spend his next vacation with us and all his vacations so long as he is attending college if he does not consider this invitation sufficiently formal i will write to him myself his father sleeps upon a glorious field soldiers are brothers everywhere so should their sons be likewise let him come to our own hearthstone and our hearts shall open to him as to one of our own blood archie was so affected by the warmth of this invitation that for some moments he could not answer come my haughty scotlander will you do us the honour said his friend or must my father send on a special embassy his chief butler jose dubé with the bagpipes slung on his back in the form of a saint andrew's cross as is the custom i believe among your highland chiefs to present you his invitation with all due formality as fortunately i am no longer in my highlands said archie laughing we can dispense with these formalities i shall write at once to captain d'haberville and thank him with my whole heart for his noble generosity to the exiled orphan then let us speak reasonably for once said jules if only for the novelty of the thing you think me very light silly and scatterbrained i acknowledge that there is a little of all that in me which does not prevent me from being in earnest more often than you think i have long been seeking a friend a true and high-hearted friend i have watched you very closely and i find you all i could wish lochiel will you be my friend without a moment's question my dear boy answered archie for i have always felt strongly attracted toward you well then cried jules grasping his hand warmly it is for life and death with us lochiel thus between a boy of twelve and a boy of fourteen was ratified a friendship which in the sequel will be exposed to the cruelest tests here's a letter from mother said jules in which there is a word for you i hope your friend master de lochiel will do us the pleasure of accepting your father's invitation we are all eager to meet him his room is ready alongside of your own 
in the box which jose will hand you there is a parcel for him which he would grieve me greatly by refusing in sending it i am thinking of the mother he has lost the box contained equal shares for the two boys of cakes sweetmeats jams and other dainties the friendship between the two boys grew stronger day by day they became inseparable their college mates dubbed them variously damon and pythias orestes and pylades nisus and euryalus at last they called them the brothers all the time lochiel was at college he spent his vacations with the d'abervilles who made no difference between the two boys unless to lavish the more marked attentions upon the young scotchman who had become as it were a son of the house it was most natural then that archie before sailing for europe should accompany jules on his farewell visit to his father's house the friendship between the two young men as we have already said is destined to be put to the bitterest trial when that code of honor which has been substituted by civilization for the truest sentiments of the human heart shall come to teach them the obligations of men who are fighting under hostile flags but why anticipate the dark future have they not enjoyed during almost ten years of college life the passing griefs the little jealousies the eager pleasures the differences and ardent reconciliations which characterize a boyish friendship End of chapter two chapter three of the canadians of old by philippe aubert de gaspe translated by sir charles g d roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary a night with the sorcerers angels and ministers of grace defend us be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell hamlet écoute comme les bois crient les hiboux fouillis épouvantés entends tu ces voix dans les hauteurs dans le lointain ou près de nous eh oui la montagne retentit dans toute sa longueur d'un furieux chant magique faust lest bogles catch him unawares where gates and howlets nightly cry when out the hellish legion sallied burns as soon as our young travellers crossing the st lawrence opposite quebec have reached point levis jose makes haste to harness a splendid norman horse into one of those low sledges which furnish the only means of transport at this season when the roads are only covered here and there with snow or ice and when overflowing streams intercept the way at intervals when they come to one of these obstacles jose unharnesses the horse all three mount and the brook is speedily forded it is true that jules who clasps jose around the waist tries every now and then to throw him off at the risk of partaking with him the luxury of a bath at a little above zero he might as well have tried to throw cap tourmente into the st lawrence jose who in spite of his comparatively small stature is as strong as an elephant laughs in his sleeve and pretends not to notice it the brook forded jose goes back for the sledge reharnesses the horse climbs into the sledge with the baggage in front of him lest he should get it wet and speedily overtakes his fellow travellers who have not halted a moment in their march thanks to jules the conversation never flags during the journey archie does nothing but laugh over the witticisms that jules perpetrates at his expense he has long given up attempting any retort we must hurry exclaimed d'haberville it is thirty-six miles from here to st thomas my uncle de beaumont takes supper at seven if we get there too late we shall probably make a poor meal the good things will be all gobbled up you know the proverb tarde venientibus ossa scotch hospitality is proverbial exclaimed archie with us the welcome is the same day or night that is the cook's business 
verily said jules i believe it as if i saw it with my own eyes were it otherwise it would show a plentiful lack of skill or good will on the part of your petticoated cooks it is delightfully primitive that scotch cookery of yours with a few handfuls of oatmeal sodden in cold water since you have neither wood nor coal in your country you can make an excellent soup at little cost and with no great expenditure of culinary science and feast your guests as well in the night as in the daytime it is quite true that when some distinguished personage seeks your hospitality which often happens since scotland is loaded down with enough coats of arms to crush a camel it is true i say that you set before him in addition to your oatmeal soup the head feet or nice juicy tail of a sheep with salt for sauce the other parts of the animal never seem to grow in scotland lochiel contented himself with glancing at jules over his shoulder and repeating quis talia fando myrmidonum dolum pumwe what's that exclaimed jules in assumed indignation you call me a myrmidon a dolopian me the philosopher and moreover my worthy pedant you abuse me in latin you who so murder the accent with your caledonian tongue that virgil must squirm in his grave you call me a myrmidon me the geometrician of my class you remember that the professor of mathematics predicted that i should be another vauban yes indeed interrupted archie in recognition of your famous perpendicular line which leaned so much to the left that all the class trembled lest it should fall and crush its base see in which our professor sought to console you by predicting that your services would be required in case of the reconstruction of the tower of pisa jules struck a tragic attitude and cried tout en souvient sinna et vieux m'assassiné you are going to stab me upon the king's highway beside this mighty st lawrence untouched by all the beauty of nature which surrounds us untouched by yon lovely cascade of montmorency which the habitants call the cow a title very much the reverse of poetic but which nevertheless expresses well enough the exquisite whiteness of the stream which leaps from its bosom like the rich and foaming flow from the milk cow's udder you are going to stab me right in sight of the isle of orleans which as we go on conceals from our view the lovely waterfall which i have so poetically described heartless wretch will nothing make you relent not even the sight of poor jose here who is touched by all this wisdom and eloquence in one so young as fenelon would have said could he have written my adventures do you know interrupted archie you are at least as remarkable in poetry as you are in geometry who can doubt it answered jules no matter my perpendicular made you all laugh and myself most of all you know however that that was only another trick of that scamp de chavigny who had stolen my exercise and rolled up another in place of it which i handed in to the teacher you all pretended not to believe me since you were but too glad to see the trickster tricked jose who ordinarily took little part in the young men's conversation and who moreover had been unable to understand what they had just been talking about now began to mutter under his breath what a queer kind of a country that where the sheep have only heads feet and tails and not even a handful of the body but after all it is none of my business the men who are the masters will fix things to suit themselves but i can't help thinking of the poor horses jose who was a regular jockey had a most tender consideration for these noble beasts then turning to archie he touched his cap and said saving your presence sir if the gentry themselves eat all the oats in your country which is because they have nothing better to eat i suppose what do the poor horses do they require to be well fed if they do much hard work the young men burst out laughing jose a little abashed by their ridicule exclaimed excuse me if i have said anything foolish 
one may make mistakes without being drunk just like master jules there who was telling you that the habitants call montmorency falls the cow because their foam is white as milk now i have a suspicion that it is because they bellow like a cow in certain winds at least that is what the old bodies say when they get chattering don't be angry old boy answered jules you are probably quite right we were laughing because you thought there were horses in scotland the animal is unknown in that country what no horses sir what do the folks do when they want to travel when i say no horses answered d'haberville you must not understand me too literally they have an animal resembling our horses but not much taller than my big dog niger it lives in the mountains wild as our caribous and not altogether unlike them when a highlander wants to travel he sounds his bagpipe all the villagers gather together and he unfolds to them his project then they scatter through the woods or rather through the heather and after a day or two of toil and tribulation they succeed occasionally in capturing one of these charming beasts then after another day or two if the brute is not too obstinate and if the highlander has enough patience he sets out on his journey and sometimes even succeeds in coming to the end of it well i must say retorted lochiel you are a pretty one to be making fun of my highlanders you have good right to be proud of this princely turnout of your own it will be hard for posterity to believe that the high and mighty lord of d'haberville sends for his son and heir in a sort of dung-cart without wheels doubtless he will send some outriders on ahead of us in order that nothing shall be lacking in our triumphal approach to the manor of saint jean paul joli well done lochiel you are saved brother mine cried jules a very neat home thrust claws for claws as one of your scottish saints exclaimed one day when he was having a scrimmage with the devil jose during this discussion was scratching his head disconsolately like caleb balderstone in the bride of lammermoor he was very sensitive on all subjects touching his master's honour what a wretched fool i am he cried in a piteous voice it is all my fault the seigneur has four carryalls in his coach-house of which two are brand new and varnished up like fiddles so that i used one for a looking-glass last sunday so then when the seigneur said to me yesterday morning get ready jose for you must go to quebec to fetch my son and his friend mr de lochiel see that you take a proper carriage i like a fool said to myself that when the roads were so bad the only thing to take was a sled like this oh yes i'm in for a good scolding i shall get off cheap if i have to do without my brandy for a month at three drinks a day added jose that will make a loss of ninety good drinks without counting extras but it's all the same to me i'll take my punishment like a man the young men were greatly amused at jose's ingenious lying for the honor of his master now said archie since you seem to have emptied your budget of all the absurdities that a hare-brained french head can contain try and speak seriously and tell me why the isle of orleans is called the isle of the sorcerers for the very simple reason answered jules that a great many sorcerers live there there you begin again with your nonsense said lochiel i am in earnest said jules these scotch are unbearably conceited they can't acknowledge any excellence in other nations do you think my dear fellow that scotland has the monopoly of witches and wizards i would beg you to know that we too have our sorcerers and that two hours ago between point levy and beaumont i might as easily as not have introduced you to a very respectable sorceress i would have you know moreover that on the estate of my illustrious father you shall see a witch of the most remarkable skill the difference is my dear boy that in scotland you burn them 
while here we treat them in a manner fitting their power and social influence ask jose if i am not telling the truth jose did not fail to confirm all he said in his eyes the witches of beaumont and saint jean port joli were genuine and mighty sorceresses but to speak seriously continued jules since you would make a reasonable man of me nolens wallens as my sixth form master used to say when he gave me a dose of the strap i believe the fable takes its rise from the fact that the habitants on the north and south shores of the river seeing the islanders on dark nights go out fishing with torches mistake their lights for will-o'-the-wisps then you know that our country folk regard the will-o'-the-wisps as witches or as evil spirits who endeavor to lure the wandering wretch to his death they even profess to hear them laugh when the deluded traveller falls into the quagmire the truth is that there is an inflammable gas continually escaping from our bogs and swampy places from which to the hobgoblins and sorcerers is but a single step impossible said archie your logic is at fault as the professor so often had to tell you you see the inhabitants of the north and south shores themselves go fishing with torches whence according to your reasoning the islanders should have called them sorcerers which is not the case while jules was shaking his head with no answer ready jose took up the word if you would let me speak gentlemen i might explain your difficulty by telling you what happened to my late father who is now dead oh by all means tell us that tell us what happened to your late father who is now dead cried jules with a marked emphasis on the last four words yes my dear jose do us the favor of telling us about it added lochiel i can't half tell the story answered jose for you see i have neither the fine accent nor the splendid voice of my lamented parent when he used to tell us what happened to him in his vigil our bodies would shake so as if with ague as would do you good to see but i'll do my best to satisfy you it happened one day that my late father who is now dead had left the city for home somewhat late he had even diverted himself a little so to speak with his acquaintances in point levis like an honest man he loved his drop and on his journeys he always carried a flask of brandy in his dogfish skin satchel they say the liquor is the milk for old men lac dulce interjected archie sententiously begging your pardon mr archie answered jos with some warmth it was neither sweet water de l'eau douce nor lake water eau de lac but very good unadulterated brandy which my late father now dead was carrying in his satchel capital upon my word cried jules it serves you right for your perpetual latin quotations i beg your pardon jose said lochiel very seriously i intended not the shadow of disrespect to your late father you are excused sir said jose entirely mollified it happened that it was quite dark when my father at last got under way his friends did their best to keep him all night telling him that he would have to pass all by himself the iron cage wherein lac corriveau did penance for having killed her husband you saw it yourselves gentlemen when leaving point levis at one o'clock she was quiet then in her cage the wicked creature with her eyeless skull but never you trust to her being blind she is a cunning one you had better believe if she can't see in the daytime she knows well enough how to find her way to torment poor folks at night well as for my late father who was as brave as his captain's sword he told his friends that he didn't care that he didn't owe la corriveau a farthing with a heap more reasons which i cannot remember now he put the whip to his horse a fine brute that could travel like the wind and was gone in a second as he was passing the skeleton he thought he heard a noise a sort of wailing but as a heavy southwest wind was blowing 
he made up his mind it was only the gale whistling through the bones of the corpse it gave him a kind of a start nevertheless and he took a good pull at the flask to brace himself up all things considered however as he said to himself christians should be ready to help each other perhaps the poor creature was wanting his prayers he took off his cap and devoutly recited a de profundis for her benefit thinking that if it didn't do her any good at least it would do her no harm and that he himself would be the better for it well then he kept on as fast as he could but for all that he heard a queer sound behind him tick-tack tick-tack like a piece of iron striking on the stones he thought it was the tire of his wheel or some piece of the wagon that had come unfastened he got out to see but found everything snug he touched the horse to make up for lost time but after a little he heard again that tick-tack tick-tack on the stones being brave he didn't pay much attention when he got to the high ground of saint michel which we passed a little way back he grew very drowsy after all said my late father a man is not a dog let us take a little nap we'll both be the better for it my horse and i well he unharnessed his horse tied his legs so he would not wander too far and said there my pet there's good grass and you can hear the brook yonder good night as my late father crawled himself into the wagon to keep out of the dew it struck him to wonder what time it was after studying the three kings to the southard and the wagon to the northard he made up his mind that it must be midnight it is time said he for honest men to be in bed suddenly however it seemed to him as if ile d'orleans was on fire he sprang over the ditch leaned on the fence opened his eyes wide and stared with all his might he saw at last that the flames were dancing up and down the shore as if all the will-o'-the-wisps all the damned souls of canada were gathered there to hold the witch's sabbath he stared so hard that his eyes which had grown a little dim grew very clear again and he saw a curious sight you would have said they were a kind of men a queer breed altogether they had a head big as a peck measure topped off with a pointed cap a yard long then they had arms legs feet and hands armed with long claws but no body to speak of their crotch begging your pardon gentlemen was split right up to their ears they had scarcely anything in the way of flesh they were kind of all bone like skeletons every one of these pretty fellows had his upper lip split like a rabbit's and through the split stuck out a rhinoceros tusk a foot long like you see mr archie in your book of unnatural history as for the nose it was nothing more nor less begging your pardon than a long pig's snout which they would rub first on one side and then on the other of their great tusk perhaps to sharpen it i almost forgot to say that they had a long tail twice as long as a cow's which they used i suppose to keep off the flies the funniest thing of all was that there were but three eyes to every couple of imps those that had but one eye in the middle of the forehead like those cyclops that your uncle who is a learned man mr jules used to read to us about out of that big book of his all latin like the priest's prayer book which he called his virgil those that had but one eye held each by the claw two novices with the proper number of eyes out of all these eyes spurted the flames which lit up ile d'orleans like broad day the novices seemed very respectful to their companions who were as one might say half blind they bowed down to them they fawned upon them they fluttered their arms and legs just like good christians dancing the minuet 
the eyes of my late father were fairly starting out of his head it was worse and worse when they began to jump and dance without moving from their places and to chant in a voice as hoarse as that of a choking cow this song hoary frisker goblin gay long-nosed neighbor come away come my grumbler in the mud brother frog of tainted blood come and on this juicy christian let us feast it while we may ah the accursed heathens exclaimed my late father an honest man cannot be sure of his property for a moment not satisfied with having stolen my favourite song which i always keep to wind up with at weddings and feasts just see how they've played the devil with it one would hardly recognise it it is christians instead of good wine that they are going to treat themselves to the scoundrels then the imps went on with their hellish song glaring at my late father and curling their long snouts around their great rhinoceros tusks come my tricksy traveller's guide devil's minion true and tried come my sucking pig my simple brother wart and brother pimple here's a fat and juicy frenchman to be pickled to be fried all that i can say to you just now my darlings cried my late father is that if you get no more fat to eat than what i'm going to bring you on my lean carcass you'll hardly need to skim your broth the goblins however seemed to be expecting something for they kept turning their heads every moment my late father looked in the same direction what was that he saw on the hillside a mighty devil built like the rest but as long as the steeple saint michel which we passed a while back instead of the pointed bonnet he wore a three-horned hat topped with a big thorn bush in place of a feather he had but one eye blackguard that he was but that was as good as a dozen he was doubtless the drum major of the regiment for he held in his hand a saucepan twice as big as our maple sugar kettles which hold twenty gallons and in the other hand a bell clapper which no doubt the dog of a heretic had stolen from some church before its consecration he pounded on his saucepan and all the scoundrels began to laugh to jump to flutter nodding to my late father as if inviting him to come and amuse himself with them you'll wait a long time my lambs thought my late father to himself his teeth chattering in his head as if he had the shaking fever you will wait a long time my gentle lambs i'm not in any hurry to quit the good lord's earth to live with the goblins suddenly the tall devil began to sing a hellish round accompanying himself on the saucepan which he beat furiously and all the goblins darted away like lightning so fast indeed that it took them less than a minute to go all the way around the island my poor late father was so stupefied by the hubbub that he could not remember more than three verses of the song which ran like this here's the spot that suits us well when it gets too hot in hell tura lura here we go all round hands all round here we go all round come along and stir your sticks you jolly dogs of heretics tura lura here we go all round hands all round here we go all round room for all there's room for all that skim or wriggle bounce or crawl tura lura here we go all round hands all round here we go all round my late father was in a cold sweat he had not yet however come to the worst of it here jose paused but i am dying for a smoke and with your permission gentlemen i'll light my pipe quite right my dear jose answered d'haberville for my own part i am dying for something else my stomach declares that this is dinner-time at college let's have a bite to eat jules enjoyed the privilege of aristocratic descent he had always a magnificent appetite this was specially excusable to-day seeing that he had dined at noon and had had an immense deal of exercise since 
End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Canadians of Old》by Philippe Aubert de Gaspé, translated by Sir Charles G. D. Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. La Corriveau. Scanarelle. Seigneur Commandeur, mon maître Don Juan vous demande si vous voulez lui faire l'honneur de venir souper avec lui. Le même la statue ma fascine le festin de pierre what the ghosts are growing ruder how they beard me to-night why this is goblin hall spirits and spectres all in all faustus jose after having unbridled the horse and given him what he called a mouthful of hay made haste to open a box which he had ingeniously arranged on the sled to serve as needs might be both for seat and larder he brought out a great napkin in which were wrapped up two roast chickens a tongue a ham a little flask of brandy a good big bottle of wine he was going to retire when jules said to him come along and take a bite with us jose yes indeed come and sit here by me said archie oh gentlemen said jose i know my place too well come now no affectations said jules we are here like three soldiers in camp will you be so good as to come you obstinate fellow since you say so gentlemen i must obey my officers answered jose the two young men seated themselves on the box which served them also for a table jose took his place very comfortably on a bundle of hay and all three began to eat and drink with a hearty appetite archie naturally abstemious had soon finished his meal having nothing better to do he began to philosophize in his lighter moods he loved to propound paradoxes for the pleasure of the argument do you know brother mine what it was that interested me most in my friend's story no exclaimed jules attacking another drumstick and what's more for the next quarter of an hour i don't care the hungry stomach has no ears oh that's no matter said archie it was those devils goblin spirits or whatever you choose to call them with only one eye i wish that the fashion could be adopted among men there would be fewer hypocrites fewer rogues and therefore fewer dupes assuredly it is some consolation to see that virtue is held in honour even among hobgoblins did you notice with what respect those one-eyed fellows were treated by the other imps that may be said jules but what does it prove it proves answered lochiel that the one-eyed fellows deserved the special attentions that were paid them they are the haute noblesse among hobgoblins above all they are not hypocrites nonsense said jules i begin to be afraid your brain is softening oh no i'm not so crazy as you think answered archie just watch a hypocrite with somebody he wants to deceive with what humility he keeps one eye half shut while the other watches the effect of his words if he had but one eye he would lose this immense advantage and would have to give up his role of hypocrite which he finds so profitable there you see is one vice the less my cyclops of a hobgoblin has probably many other vices but he is certainly no hypocrite whence the respect to which he is treated by a class of beings stained with all the vices in the category here's your health my scottish philosopher exclaimed jules tossing off a glass of wine hanged if i understand a word of your reasoning though but it's clear as day answered archie the heavy and indigestible stuff with which you are loading down your stomach must be clogging your brains if you ate nothing but oatmeal as we highlanders do your ideas would be a good deal clearer that oatmeal seems to stick in your throat my friend said jules it ought to be easy enough to digest however even without the help of sauce here's another example said archie 
a rogue who wishes to cheat an honest man in any kind of a transaction always keeps one eye winking or half shut while the other watches to see whether he is gainin or losin in the trade one eye is plottin while the other watches that is a vast advantage for the rogue his antagonist on the other hand seein one eye clear frank and honest cannot suspect what is goin on behind the eye which blinks and plots and calculates while its fellow keeps as impenetrable as fate now let us reverse the matter continued archie let us suppose the same rogue in the same circumstances but blind of one eye the honest man watching his face may often read in his eye his inmost thoughts for my cyclops being himself suspicious is constrained to keep his one eye wide open rather laughed jules if he doesn't want to break his neck granted replied lochiel but still more for the purpose of reading the soul of him he wants to deceive he finds it necessary moreover to give his eye an expression of candour and good fellowship in order to divert suspicion which must absorb a portion of his wits then since there are few men who can follow without the help of both their eyes two different trains of thought at the same time our rogue finds that he has lost half of his advantage he renounces his wicked colin and society is the richer by one more honest man my poor archie murmured jules i see that we have exchanged roles that i am now the scotch philosopher as i so courteously entitle you while you are the crazy frenchman as you irreverently term me for don't you see my new prometheus that this one-eyed race of men endowed with all the virtues which you intend to substitute might very readily blink if that is an infallible recipe for deception and for the purpose of taking observations just open their eye from time to time oh you french you frivolous french you deluded french no wonder the english catch you on the hip in diplomacy it would seem to me interrupted jules that the scotch ought to know something by this time about english diplomacy archie's face saddened and grew pale his friend had touched a sore spot jules perceived this at once and said forgive me dear fellow if i have hurt you i know the subject is one that calls up painful memories i spoke as usual without thinking one often thoughtlessly wounds those one best loves by a retort which one may think very witty but come let us drink to a merry life go on with your remarkable reasoning that will be pleasanter for both of us the cloud has passed over and i resume my argument said lochiel repressing his emotion don't you see that my rascal could not shut his eye for an instant without the risk of his prey escaping him do you remember the squirrel that we saved last year from that great snake at the foot of the old maple tree in your father's park remember how the snake kept its glowing eyes fixed upon the poor little creature in order to fascinate it how the squirrel kept springing from branch to branch with piteous cries unable to remove its gaze for an instant from that of the hideous reptile when we made it look away it was saved do you remember how joyous it was after the death of its enemy well my friend let our rogue shut his eye and his prey escapes him verily said jules you are a mighty dialectician i shouldn't wonder if you would some day eclipse if you don't do it already such prattlers as socrates zeno montaigne and other philosophers of that ilk the only danger is lest your logic should some day land you in the moon you think you can make fun of me said archie very well but only let some pedant with his pen behind his ear undertake to refute my thesis seriously and a hundred scribblers in battle array will take sides for and against and floods of ink will flow 
the world has been deluged with blood itself in defence of theories about as reasonable as mine why such a thing has often been enough to make a man famous meanwhile answered jules your argument will serve as one of those after-pieces with which sancho panza used to put don quixote to sleep as for me i greatly prefer the story of our friend jose you are easily pleased sir said the latter who had been taking a nap during the scientific discussion let us listen said archie conticuere omnes in ora tenebant conticuere you irrepressible pedant cried d'haberville it's not one of the priest's stories put in jos briskly but it is as true as if he had told it from the pulpit for my late father never lied we believe you my dear jos said lochiel but now please go on with your delightful narrative well said jos it happened that my late father brave as he was was in such a devil of a funk that the sweat was hanging from the end of his nose like a head of oats there he was the dear man with his eyes bigger than his head never daring to budge presently he thought he heard behind him the tick-tack tick-tack which he had already heard several times on the journey but he had too much to occupy his attention in front of him to pay much heed to what might pass behind suddenly when he was least expecting it he felt two great bony hands like the claws of a bear grip him by the shoulders he turned around horrified and found himself face to face with la corriveau who was climbing on his back she had thrust her hands through the bars of her cage and succeeded in clutching him but the cage was heavy and at every leap she fell back again to the ground with a hoarse cry without losing her hold however on the shoulders of my late father who bent under the burden if he had not held tight to the fence with both hands he would have been crushed under the weight my poor late father was so overwhelmed with horror that one might have heard the sweat that rolled off his forehead dropping down on the fence like grains of duck shot my dear francie said la corriveau do me the pleasure of taking me to dance with my friends of ile d'orleans oh you devil's wench cried my late father that was the only oath the good man ever used and that only when very much tried the deuce exclaimed jules it seems to me that the occasion was a very suitable one for my own part i should have been swearing like a heathen and i said archie like an englishman isn't that much the same thing answered d'haberville you are wrong my dear jules i must acknowledge that the heathen acquit themselves very well but the english oh my le roux who soon as he got out of college made a point of reading all the bad books he could get hold of told us if you remember that that blackguard of a voltaire as my uncle the jesuit used to call him had declared in a book of his treating of what happened in france in the reign of charles the seventh when that prince was hunting the islanders out of his kingdom le roux told us that voltaire had put it on record that every englishman swears well my boy those events took place about the year fourteen forty five let us say three hundred years ago judge then what dreadful oaths that ill-tempered nation must have invented in the course of three centuries i surrender said jules but go on my dear jose devil's wench exclaimed my late father is that your gratitude for my de profundis and all my other prayers you'd drag me into the orgy would you i was thinking you must have been in for at least three or four thousand years of purgatory for your pranks and you had only killed two husbands which was a mere nothing so having always a tender heart for everything i felt sorry for you and said to myself we must give you a helping hand and this is the way you thank me that you want to straddle my shoulders and ride me to hell like a heretic my dear francie said la corriveau take me over to dance with my dear friends 
and she knocked her head against that of my late father till her skull rattled like a dry bladder filled with pebbles you may be sure said my late father you hellish wench of judas iscariot i'm not going to be your jackass to carry you over to dance with those pretty darlings my dear francie answered the witch i cannot cross the st lawrence which is a consecrated stream except with the help of a christian get over as best you can you devilish gallows bird said my late father get over as best you can every one to his own business oh yes a likely thing that i'll carry you over to dance with your dear friends but that will be a devil of a journey you have come the lord knows how dragging that fine cage of yours which must have torn up all the stones on the king's highway a nice row there'll be when the inspector passes this way one of these days and finds the road in such a condition and then who but the poor habitant will have to suffer for your frolics getting fined for not having kept the road properly the drum major suddenly stopped beating on his great saucepan all the goblins halted and gave three yells three frightful whoops like the indians give when they have danced that war dance with which they always begin their bloody expeditions the island was shaken to its foundation the wolves the bears all the other wild beasts and the demons of the northern mountains took up the cry and the echoes repeated till it was lost in the forests of the far-off saguenay my poor late father thought that the end of the world had come and the day of judgment the tall devil with the saucepan struck three blows and a silence most profound succeeded the hellish hubbub he stretched out his arm toward my late father and cried with a voice of thunder will you make haste you lazy dog will you make haste you cur of a christian and ferry our friend across we have only fourteen thousand four hundred times more to prance around the island before cock crow are you going to make her lose the best of the fun go to the devil where you all belong answered my late father losing all patience come my dear francie said la corriveau be a little more obliging you are acting like a child about a mere trifle moreover see how the time is flying come now one little effort no no my wench of satan said my late father would to heaven you still had on the fine collar which the hangman put around your neck two years ago you wouldn't have so clear a windpipe during this dialogue the goblins on the island resumed their chorus here we go all round hands all round here we go all round my dear francie said the witch if your body and bones won't carry me over i'm going to strangle you i will straddle your soul and ride over to the festival with these words she seized him by the throat and strangled him what exclaimed the young man she strangled your poor late father now dead when i said strangled it was very little better than that answered jos for the dear man lost his consciousness when he came to himself he heard a little bird which cried que tu who art thou oh ho said my late father it's plain i'm not in hell since i hear the dear lord's birds he opened first one eye then the other and saw that it was broad daylight the sun was shining right in his face the little bird perched on a neighboring branch kept crying que tu my dear child said my late father it is not very easy to answer your question for i'm not very certain this morning just who i am only yesterday i believed myself to be a brave honest and god-fearing man but i have had such an experience this night that i can hardly be sure that it is i francie dubay here present in body and soul then the dear man began to sing here we go all round hands all round here we go all round in fact he was half bewitched at last however he perceived that he was lying full length in a ditch 
where happily there was more mud than water but for that my poor late father who now sleeps with the saints surrounded by all his relations and friends and fortified by all the holy sacraments would have died without absolution like a monkey in his old tree begging your pardon for the comparison young gentleman when he had got his face clear from the mud of the ditch in which he was stuck fast as in a vice the first thing he saw was his flask on the bank above him at this he plucked up his courage and stretched out his hand to take a drink but no such luck the flask was empty the witch had drained every drop my dear jose said lochiel i think i am about as brave as the next one nevertheless if such an adventure had happened to me never again would i have travelled alone at night nor i either said d'haberville to tell you the truth gentlemen said jose since you are so discriminating i will confess that my late father who before this adventure would not have turned a hair in the graveyard at midnight was never afterward so bold he dared not even go alone after sunset to do his chores in the stable and very sensible he was but finish your story said jules it is finished said jose my late father harnessed his horse who appeared poor brute to have noticed nothing unusual and made his way home fast as possible it was not till a fortnight later that he told us his adventure what do you say to all that my self-satisfied skeptic who would refuse to canada the luxury of witches and wizards inquired d'haberville i say answered archie that our highland witches are mere infants compared with those of new france and what's more if ever i get back to my scottish hills i'm going to imprison all our hobgoblins in bottles as lesage did with his wooden-legged devil asmodeus hm said jose it would serve them just right accursed blackguards but where would you get bottles big enough there'd be the difficulty End of chapter 4